part two of breaking down Mike Bickle's personal statement. I am a trauma therapist specializing in narcissistic and spiritual abuse, and we are still on paragraph one. He puts in parentheses, I am not admitting to the more intense sexual activities that some are suggesting. Pause. That again is very intentionally vague. There have been a few things that have been insinuated. Um, we have no idea which ones he's denying and which ones he's taking ownership for. Um, but again, it is purposefully vague. Let's keep going. I hate my sin and I see it as serious and grievous before a holy God. You know what? I love that sentence. 10 out of 10. Good job, Mike. Okay, here, here's where it gets a little wonky. I take all sin seriously. So on those occasions, with an S, I quickly and sincerely repented in a way that resulted in receiving assurance from God, followed by a daily resolve to live holy in all of my ways. Okay, I'm just going to like pause right here and put in a screenshot. When Jane Doe went on the record with Julie Roy's, she discussed how Mike would have her pray Psalm 51 over them after he would push the boundaries sexually. So if that is one example of the ways that Mike was seeking assurance and repenting in God's eyes, um, there is uh, so much wrong here to unpack. Um, but what we're not seeing is public accountability. We're not hearing that he confessed in any of his other relationships. We don't know that he has confessed the full scope to Diane or those who he is doing ministry with, but we do know that he allegedly would have Jane Doe pray. And I mean, hey, it kind of fits if we look at the narrative in cohesion. Mike is a very big, um, spend lots of time and prayer kind of guy. His whole movement is based on prayer and spending time just one-on-one -on -one with God in prayer. And so if that is the extent of the repentance and seeking assurance that he was applying here, um, we've got some bigger theological and moral problems on our hands. Another point to note is, Holy in all of my ways is quite a statement there. Like that is very grandiose. He again is not acknowledging his humanity. I think it's also worth noting that in his leaked emails, this is the same man who was saying things like, I am 100% sure that God told me this, or I know for a fact that God is saying that. He talks about only seeing what God sees and saying what God says. I mean, these are big statements that are really grandiose in nature, even though they sound very spiritual. That's really all it is. This is what we refer to as spiritual bypassing. So spiritual bypassing is essentially uh, sidestepping or avoiding dealing with underlying personal challenges, like unresolved emotional wounds, um, basically a way to avoid doing any inner work in a way that fosters introspection and self-awareness. Oftentimes, people will just slap some spiritual principles, some Bible verses of forgiveness, like let go of the past, um, press delete and move on. Oh, I pray this psalm and my conscience is cleared. Essentially, it is just using spiritual practices to avoid or deny working on problems that are not going to be fixed by spiritual band-aids. This can be really dangerous territory, especially when applying spiritual principles to things that have much more nuance like trauma, unresolved issues in a person's life, not just for the person who is doing the bypassing, but also for anyone who's bending an ear towards them because it can be very deceptive. One term I would also like to introduce here at the beginning is a term called breadcrumbing. Breadcrumbing is essentially appeasing someone, like saying or doing just enough to kind of like string someone along. So this can be, you know, in romantic relationships, like giving a little bit here and there, like enough to tide someone over per se. But basically it is just a form of emotional manipulation. And so this is giving uh, just enough for people to stop like 
a attacking him, being like, we know you're guilty, but it is not an acceptable level of confession or accountability um, or acknowledgement even about the severity and the nature of what he has done. Okay, anyway, I digress. Let's get back into it. God graciously helped me to respond in those times with a broken and contrite heart that was filled with godly sorrow. To this day, I remain sorrowful about those past failures. You know, what we're not hearing is sorrow over Jane Doe or Jane Doe's plural. What we're not hearing is why he feels sorrowful. Uh, but what we are hearing is that God helped Mike to have an emotional expression towards his own sin that Mike deemed was satisfactory to warrant having repented and being able to move forward in the ministry with a clear conscience. When he talks about this broken and contrite heart, this godly sorrow, uh, remaining sorrowful about these past failures, which again, elusive language, um, what we're hearing with those kinds of phrases is, this is how crappy I feel. I feel so awful. We talked about motivational empathy in the emails videos, but um, this motivational empathy can also take form of, you know, eliciting uh, sympathy or empathy from your audience. And so when he's telling you how uh, sorrowful and sad he has felt over all of this and how grieved he has been, that sounds good. Like we would hope that someone genuinely does feel that way. Um, and, and we could have a little bit of empathy and understanding for them. Uh, but I, I just want to point out how delayed this actually has been. This has not been eating him up for all of these years because he found a way to feel good about it with God. You know what I mean? Like he reasoned in his mind and in his faith that God was cool with it based on whatever way he and God determined that was good. And so to the rest of us, we can be like, sir, Absolutely not. Like th that is not, that's not how this works. I think that maybe Mike genuinely believes that he and God are really just like that good and that tight. And therefore all of these other people are easily able to believe that. And you know, when people are just looking for someone who seems sincere and genuine and what they're saying, it's not that hard to be convincing when you believe yourself that you have a direct line to God and that you're batting a thousand when it comes to hearing his voice and experiencing him through all of these angelic encounters and the like. It is not that hard to convince other people uh, of the same thing. And when it's all said and done, and as the truth keeps making its way out, um, I think there's going to be a lot of disillusionment for many because it's my opinion that Mike is either one of the greatest charismatic con men of all time or he is very deceived and misguided himself um, and has just become far too influential while remaining unhealthy in ways that have been impenetrable by his own application of scripture and grace and his gifting. And no matter which side of the fence you fall on, I hope that we can all acknowledge and agree that there are scriptures that talk about those who have high levels of gifting and power and God gives good gifts without repentance. Um, but there are some that at the end of their days, they get to the Lord and say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. We did this in your name. We prophesied in your name. And he will say, I never knew you. And listen, please do not hear what I'm not saying. Uh, I'm not saying that Mike is not a Christian. That is not my knowledge to have. Only the Lord knows a person's heart and their heart intentions. Uh, but I would also just like to make an appeal to people who are on the other side of the fence who are really advocating that we be uh, gentle and merciful and quick to forgive, which, you know, I'm all for forgiveness. Um, but those, especially who were talking about 
a restoration to ministry, um, it's my opinion that rushing into that could not only be detrimental for the body of Christ in the event that Mike is a wolf in sheep's clothing, maybe he doesn't even know it. And the secondary danger in that for Mike, if you care about him, is that that might prevent him from ever having to truly reconcile with God over what he has done in God's name. And that, my friends, should be a very sobering reality. For those of you who don't understand why um, people are frustrated with this kind of apology as opposed to like, hey, good for him. He's getting it out there. We'll pray for him and his family. Yes, please do pray for him and his family. But I just like to say exercise discernment about how you choose to pray for him. I wouldn't be as quick to say he needs to be restored to the ministry because what if him having this ministry is the thing that has not allowed him to go to rock bottom enough to truly understand how to have a, a fear of the Lord. So I'm going to reel it in um, and just leave that food for thought here. Um, so yeah, that's my time. I'll be back for part three.